Let me introduce our keynote speaker. His name is Luke Billingham. He is a youth and community worker at Hackney Quest, which is a long running grassroots charity in Hackney in London. He's also a researcher on an economic and social research council funded project looking at the public health approach to violence reduction. And at Hackney Quest, Luke is involved with mentoring, exclusion prevention, youth voice and community development projects. There's also more information about Luke in the Euromet programme. So if you go to the Euromet website, you'll be able to read a lot more about him there. OK, I think that's it from me. Do use the Q&A function and put your comments in the chat. And I'm going to now hand over to Luke. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Melissa. I will just share my screen. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's brilliant to be here with you this afternoon. Um, and thank you very much to Catch22 for inviting me to talk with you all. So the focus of my talk, as you heard, is on the worries and the hopes that I have for young people in Britain in the post-pandemic era. I'm obviously from Britain, but I'm aware that we have a pan-European audience. So I'm, I'm hoping that what I discuss won't be too parochial and will feel relevant beyond our little island. In case you're wondering, the person whose back of head you can see there is a brilliant young man who I've been, in, been working with for many years. And what you can see in the background is a, is a sports cage, a ball court, where he spent much of his youth and where just a few years before him, I also spent much of my youth in Hackney. So after telling you a little bit more about my background, these are the three things that I want to talk about. I'm going to offer a few brief reflections on the immediate impact of COVID-19 on young people as I've seen it. And then I'm going to talk about my worries about and hopes for the future. And when I say the future, I don't just mean the next few years as we emerge from the pandemic. I'm interested in how it might affect life for future generations. I want to zoom out to think about the era which led up to the pandemic and the era that could potentially follow it. Because I think as people who work with young people, we often ponder not just the next couple of years, but the joys, the dangers, the pleasures and the harms that might be faced by younger generations throughout their lives. We work with 15 year olds and we wonder what life will be like when they're 35 or 55 or when they have children of their own. So that's what I'm going to ruminate on. That's what I'm going to be talking about um, for the next half an hour or so. And hopefully there'll be at least something in my ramblings that will be of interest. So to share a bit more about my background, um, before I talk about my employers, um, I guess I should say that I'm, I'm doing this talk in a personal capacity. Um, and so all the views that I express are entirely my own. They're not to be associated with my employers. And some of what I say might be deemed somewhat contentious. So maybe it's important to say that. So I work part time at Hackney Quest, where I've been for five years. It's a youth and community centre in Hackney in North East London um, that works with eight to 18 year olds and often works with young people from the age of eight to the age of 18. It was founded in 1988, so it's three years older than me. Um, and I could spend the whole half hour telling you all about Hackney Quest, but I think maybe the most helpful way of describing it is that it's less an organization that delivers projects and activities, and it's more of a community institution which provides love and care and support to local young people and their families. My other part-time role is working as a research associate for the Open University, and I'm working on an ESRC funded project which is examining what exactly happened in Scotland that led to the big reduction in violence that we've seen there over the past kind of decade. And then we'll also look at how English cities and especially London are attempting to learn from the policies in Scotland and attempting to implement somewhat similar ideas. I only started this role um, earlier this month though. Um, prior to that, I spent about four years helping to found and start up Reach Children's Hub, which is a charity based in a school, uh, Reach Academy Feltham in southwest London. And the charity works with the school to provide cradle to career support for local children, young people and families. Together, they form a kind of children's zone providing that support. Some of you may know about Harlem Children's Zone and West London Zone. It's a somewhat similar model. <clears throat> 
And in a voluntary capacity, um, I have roles at a few different criminal justice charities, um, Newbridge, Longford Trust and Haven Distribution, all of which work to support people who are currently in prison or people who have been in prison. And lastly, the other thing that keeps me busy is writing. Um, so I've written or contributed to a fair number of reports about young people's lives. So Hackney Wick Through Young Eyes was um, a research project that I co-led with a group of paid young people exploring what life was like for young people in a particular part of Hackney. I've written a report about the importance of sports cages and multi-use games areas to young people, hence the image at the start. And I was also one of the co-authors of last year's Parliamentary Youth Violence Commission final report. And I've written academically as well. And through all of this work and all of this research, I think my main reflection is the extent of preventable harms that many of our young people experience just because of who they are and where they are in our society and in history. The life prospects of young people in this country are significantly determined by the fact that some communities experience an acute concentration of pain and of pressure, whilst other communities experience an equally disproportionate amount of power and of privilege. To reduce preventable harms in young people's lives and to address this hideous level of inequality, we don't just need great organisations and great services, we need to work towards a much better society for our young people. And I'll talk a bit more about that later. But firstly then, I want to talk a little bit about the immediate impact of COVID-19 on young people as I've seen it through my work. And I'll tie in the points I make now that these brief reflections to wider points that I'd like to discuss. So firstly, of course, there have been a number of effects of the pandemic which have been unambiguously negative in their consequences for young people. Most importantly, it's caused death on a tragically large scale. A lot of people are experiencing terrible loss and bereavement. And in the rush to think about how we emerge from the pandemic and how the pandemic makes a difference to society moving forward, we mustn't forget those who have been lost or those who are grieving. The job market has obviously been badly affected, especially for young people. Education has been profoundly disrupted for all young people. I've seen a deep sense of disorientation among those young people that I work with. Usually young people's lives are all about progress, all about direction, all about uh, purpose, growth. But I think the pandemic profoundly disturbed that. And I've, I've found myself feeling somewhat vicariously disoriented because in the, in, in the wake of the pandemic, it's been difficult to know how to guide young people forward because it's been more difficult to know what progress for different young people actually really means. And there's been significant isolation and lack of human contact for very large numbers of young people. But then I think there's many effects of the pandemic which have been entirely dependent on individual circumstances. It hasn't been possible or advisable really to make grand generalizations about how the pandemic has affected these things. Mental health, for instance. Of course, the pandemic has been utterly devastating for the mental health of many people, including many young people, but not all. Some of the young people that I work with have benefited enormously from a sustained period out of school, especially where they attend schools which are particularly punitive and rigid and cold institutions. They've actually benefited quite a lot in terms of their mental health and well-being, being out of those institutions for a while. In terms of family relationships, the pandemic has obviously in some cases significantly exacerbated family tension and family disharmony. But in other cases, families have really benefited from more time together. Similarly with friendships, some friendships have been significantly strained through the past year, but others have been strengthened. I think you, we've really been able to see the extent to which social bonds make a huge difference to our lives through the period of the past year. Even with housing, for many, of course, their work situation has been really negatively affected by the pandemic. Many have lost their jobs and that's led to quite desperate situations when it comes to housing. For others, though, I know some cases where the pandemic has led to families getting 
much better, more focused support and actually better outcomes when it comes to their housing situation. Lastly, in terms of creativity and in, in terms of talents, I've worked with young people who, who found their, their sense of creativity and their, and their pursuit of their talents almost kind of deadened during the pandemic and, and kind of quashed. In other cases, young people have found new forms of creative expression. They've found new talents during this time. So the immediate impact of the pandemic on young people, at least in my experience with the young people that I work with, has varied enormously. For some young people, it's kind of completely overhauled their existence. But for quite a few of the young people that I work with, the impact of the pandemic on their particular circumstances actually wasn't too significant. And that's especially the case for those young people who've been experiencing a mountain of complex difficulties long before the pandemic, which the pandemic has just added a few additional rocks to. And that's because for many of these young people, the dif difficulties that they face are tied to historically entrenched systematic inequalities and injustices, which far predate the pandemic and were not entirely changed by it. What I'm most interested to talk about and to focus on for, for the rest of the talk is how the current pandemic crisis could affect these entrenched inequalities and injustices and so affect the future of our young people. I want to zoom out and think about historical trends over the past few decades that have led up to the present. And I want to think about where history could potentially be headed after the pandemic. Like at any time, we're faced with multiple possible paths out of our present situation. It's clear the pandemic will alter history in some way, and it will change the prospects of our young people, but it's not yet clear how. That will entirely depend on political contestation over the next few years, which we're all involved in, in one way or another, whether we like this or not. And I think I've seen plenty of green shoots in terms of potential for positive change, but also some fairly dystopian trends. And I've represented this in a, in a somewhat abstract diagram here. So on the left is the past, in the present is the current pandemic situation, and on the right is the future. So time is traveling from left to right. The red lines here on this diagram represent those negative historical factors, what I'm calling dystopian trends. So it represents the ideas, the policies, the structures, the injustices that have been harming our young people over the past few decades. And the thicker their line, the thicker the line, the stronger their power, their influence over young people. The green lines here represent historical forces which have been present over the past few decades, which can improve young people's lives, which can improve their safety, make for a more just society, make young people's lives more equitable. As at any time in the past few decades, there's been a complex mix of historical factors affecting the lives of young people, some positive for them, some negative. Now, in the period of the pandemic, we're at a time of crisis and uncertainty. And it's not clear how this current period of time will affect those historical forces in the future. One possibility is that the overall effect of the current crisis will be to strengthen the trends that are damaging our young people. It could strengthen ideas, policies, systems, which make society more unjust, more unequal, less safe for our young people. Alternatively, we could emerge from the pandemic with better prospects facing our young people. The prospect could strengthen the ideas, beliefs, structures, historical forces, which could improve life for future generations. Long before the pandemic, many commentators were highlighting evidence that the next few decades will see prof profound societal change, that our lifetime will be a time of significant historical transformation. The political economist Wolfgang Streeck published a book called How Will Capitalism End back in 2016. Before that, in 2013, an international team of historians and social scientists published a book called Does Capitalism Have a Future? All of these academics were agreed that we were approaching some significant societal shifts. It was just not yet clear whether for good or for ill. And they were making these arguments even before the pandemic was even predictable. 
I think the pandemic opens possibilities for the next few decades even wider. It will alter our trajectory. What I hope is that this period of crisis could reorient our societies towards a more equitable, more just future, but it is not guaranteed. So in the rest of this talk, I'm going to get much more specific and a lot less abstract and a lot less dominated by diagrams. I want to share what I think are some of the most significant kind of red and green lines in the present. I want to discuss some of the most damaging historical trends of the past few years as I see it, which I fear could be further exacerbated by the pandemic. And also the more positive, the more hopeful historical tendencies, which I think could improve life for future generations and could potentially be strengthened by this time of crisis. I'll start with the negative and the damaging. I'm going to paint a picture of a dystopian year 2040, so just under 20 years from now. Um, considering dystopias is, is helpful because it can bring worrying historical tendencies into sharp, clarifying relief. I'm going to present a worst case scenario that I fear we might have been heading, heading to even before the, cri the pandemic crisis hit and which potentially the crisis could make more likely. Some of what I talk about may seem kind of peculiarly British um, to those of you who aren't from Britain, but hopefully much of it will seem somewhat universal. And don't worry, this is going to be quite unrelentingly grim when I talk about this, but I'll be exploring the, the green shoots in a moment. I'll, I'll end on the positive. For now, though, I'm going to be doom laden about society, about what could happen to the public sector, and about trends that I see now in the charity sector that I fear could be worsened by the pandemic. So this is my brief description of a year 2040, which is dystopian. In 2040, Britain has become so unequal that young people from different backgrounds are treated as though they are of different levels of moral worth. Some young people are locked into lives of opportunity, choice and privilege, while others are excluded from the means to live a dignified life. Gated communities have proliferated in tandem with food banks. Those whose families have always hoarded wealth own London and the grip of wealth on power is firm and stubborn. Money, influence, security, status and freedom are amassed in gargantuan quantities among the tiny minority of ultra-privileged people, while the poorest people amass only debt, precariousness and shame. There's a lot of discussion about what causes poverty. Plenty of researchers win big grants to develop new theories about flawed decision-making and poor parenting. There isn't much conversation about how our political economy systematically facilitates destitution. All young people without an inheritance live lives of immense financial insecurity and strain. Many are uprooted from the only neighborhood they have ever called home to make way for those who can afford its rents. The idea that Britain is a meritocracy still laughably lingers. The have nots and the have yachts are both taught to believe that they receive their just desserts. As in Victorian times, those with wealth and power see the poor and the powerless as at once fascinating, intimidating and incomprehensible. Poorer people are the subject of massive surveillance, monitoring, disciplining and control when they're not being put in metaphorical petri dishes to experiment on with the latest social innovations. Inarticulate rage simmers among young people in areas where harm and disadvantaged, disadvantage are most concentrated. All too often, they take this out on one another. Young people who express protest and dissent towards authorities are criminalized, especially young people of color. Critiques of specific injustices are deemed unpatriotic and anti-British. Schools are under increasing pressure to nurture a nebulous love of country and to focus relentlessly on instilling good behavioral habits above all else. Racial injustice is continually denied by power holders and institutions, despite the qualitatively different lives experienced by those from different ethnic heritages. Where racism is acknowledged, organizational or personal self-interrogation is rare. It's largely through platitudes aimed at positive PR rather than policies aimed at shifting power. 
Charity adverts are all over public transport, all over roadside billboards. The children and young people that feature in them look vacant, a little bit grubby, but not too grubby. Similar portrayals of innocent and helpless children and young people appear in some newspapers and government reports. In other publications though, focused on those who are deemed deviant, young people are presented as chaotic, as dysfunctional, as a threat. Young people are patronized and demonized in equal measure. For many young people, illegal work seems more accessible and appealing than legitimate work. The practices of legal employers are not much less brutally exploitative than those of criminal organizations. Charities and social services are incentivized to push young people into whatever work is available, however demeaning, however dead end. Parents are increasingly under-supported and increasingly stigmatized and judged, especially mothers. They're blamed for their children's struggles as if all parenting was done in a vacuum, unaffected by social and economic circumstances. There are charities doing all they can to provide the best possible support and care for parents, but there are also organizations cashing in on parental stigma to win contracts delivering simplistic and poorly conceived parenting courses. Enormously wealthy people, even those who obtained their riches through exploitation and corruption, which harmed communities, families, and young people, are welcomed with open arms by charities that are desperate for funds. Some of these philanthropists say horribly demeaning things about the young people that the charities serve, but their staff can only nod and smile. Grassroots youth charities are desperately scarce. Larger monop monopolistic charities have outposts across the country, helicoptering in staff to communities that they know nothing about. The bosses of well-resourced national charities have close personal connections with government ministers and with the big evaluation consultancies. There's plenty of mutual black back slapping and plenty of charity dinners. Young people tell their stories at these dinners. They aren't paid for it. There are countless league tables, ranking programs and interventions which have the best evaluation evidence for addressing every conceivable problem in young people's lives. The social, economic and political causes of young people's hardship are bracketed out of most of these studies and from almost all discussion about what works. Large charities rake in funding on the basis of evaluation reports which demonstrate that, for instance, if you put poorer, less well-nourished, traumatized young people for a particular charity program when they're bet between the age of 14 and 16, it will have a small but statistically significant effect on their outcomes. Organizations that fail to implement the latest successfully random control trialed programs from the United States quickly lose funding. Local councils spend big chunks of their bu budgets on consultants who come in to teach them about the latest ideas. There's excitable discussion about systems change, about service design, behavioral insights, agile leadership, but none of the consultants can help the councils deliver effective services with ever diminishing funding. Every profession serving our most complex young people is increasingly underpaid, undertrained, undersupported, and underrespected. People working in these professions are seen as the administrators of interventions rather than skilled professionals delivering caring relationships with young people. They feel like they're barely, co barely coping to hold crises, to hold crises at bay rather than having any prospect of helping young people build better lives. Every social problem has a social venture to, aggress to address it. There's th thousands of social enterprises developing products and services to address a plethora of specific societal issues. Some of them succeed financially, gather a solid evidence base and scale up. Some of them make a big difference, but more often they barely scratch the surface of the problems they are addressing. Politicians still scramble to have their photos taken with their founders. There's more prisons than ever before. Our society would sooner disappear away people who are deemed problematic than address the deep-rooted social problems which predictably breed harm. More prisons are being built for women than our women's centers, refuges, or children's centers. More and more charities are running prisons, secure children homes, and young offenders institutions. The distinction between the most financially successful charities and companies like G4S or Serco is becoming blurry. They compete in the same races for government contracts on the basis of efficiency. Punitive policies are profitable. Young people are pathologized and prejudged like never before. 
especially those from poorer backgrounds and those who are of color. Government, the media, businesses, and large charities all contribute to this to their mutual benefit, opting to manage the symptoms of inequality and injustice rather than address their roots. So as you can tell from that, I'm fairly worried about where the future could be headed uh, in a kind of worst case scenario. Um, but I don't think I'm being kind of groundlessly grumpy. Um, I think milder forms of everything I've mentioned there are already visible in society and in the charity sector. There's immense disgraceful levels of inequality. There's kind of Victorian attitudes towards the undeserving poor. We lionize wealth and the wealthy. There's a grim kind of philanthro capitalism developing. We demonize young people, but condescend them at the same time. There's a proliferation of monetized fad ideas, growing nationalism, authoritarianism, and the idea that you can solution away deep social problems. It's not entirely impossible that something a bit like my dark dystopia could materialize in the era beyond the pandemic. But it's also not at all inevitable. There are much more promising historical trends that have emerged before the pandemic and have been strengthened by them and could improve life greatly for younger generations. So now I'll get a lot more positive and I'll talk about those green shoots. And there's a lot of them, but I'm gonna focus just on six that um, I think are particularly important. All of these things kind of existed long before the pandemic, um, but I think there are signs that they've been strengthened by the pandemic crisis. Um, and there are signs that these kind of trends could lead to a much better future for young people in the era beyond the pandemic. So firstly, and, and maybe most importantly, I see a generation rising which is utterly intolerant of inequality and injustice. Obviously in every generation, young people grow up experiencing how the mistakes and the prejudices of older generations have hardened into structures, policies, and systems. As Keir Milburn has put it, young people as they grow up make fresh contact with the problems and issues in society which older generations may have become blind or desensitized to. This is true of every generation, but the current crop of young people is facing such a vastly different economic and ecological fate to older generations, with such vastly different technological resources at their disposal and such a vastly different cultural outlook, which I think makes the current generation of young people particularly willing to challenge the injustices they see. I don't think we've seen such a gulf between generations as we have now since maybe back in the 1960s. And I know, and I've had the pleasure of working with plenty of utterly inspirational under thirties who seem brilliantly well equipped to change the world for the better and who are distinctly intolerant of all forms of inequality and injustice. They challenge what they see in school where it's clearly ethically wrong. They attend university, they see university life for the first time, and they call out the misogyny, they call out the racism that they see there. They join the working world, they get their first job, and they question the exploitation, they question the power imbalances that they see there. They get involved in charity projects, they see tokenistic exploitation, and they call it out. They see dubious practices, and they call them out. And this gives me massive hope for the future that young people can build. And especially over the past year, I've been enormously inspired by the young people who've been involved with the Black Lives Matter movement, who are dedicated to dismantling racist injustice, not just as a kind of behavior in some people, but as a structural, systemic, institutional injustice. And there are brilliant organizations all over the country, like Forefront, Take Back the Power, Reclaim Manchester, Hackney Account Advocacy Academy, who provide brilliant support for this growing generation of young people. And I think the generation that is rising does have the collective power and potential to forge a new, much better kind of society. Secondly, I think since the financial crash in 2008, and certainly since the pandemic, there's been a heightened awareness of economic injustice. In this country, for instance, much as it really pains me to say as an Arsenal fan, the Manchester United player Marcus Rashford has brilliantly dismantled three of the biggest lies of economic policy making in Britain over the past few decades. The idea that there's no real poverty in Britain 
the idea that if there is, it's the poor people's fault. And lastly, the idea that if there is real poverty, those people don't deserve help. I think people like Marcus Rashford has really shone a light on the intellectual and moral bankruptcy of those kinds of ideas. And I think there has been, over the course of the pandemic, a kind of strengthened cultural recognition that everybody is of equal moral worth and that society's structures and systems should reflect that rather than allowing destitution and rather than allowing gargantuan inequality. And obviously ideas like universal basic income are growing in popularity because they address this. They address the deadening precariousness faced by far too many people. And they would introduce a kind of universal material security paid for by all. I think there's increased support and appetite for bold changes like these. And again, especially among the young. Thirdly, I think we've seen massive support for key workers and a bit of a shift in our sense of who provides most economic value. And this is both of frontline caring professionals, but also those who keep the food system going, keep retail going, who deliver goods, who keep us moving in transport. They've all experienced, I think, well-deserved recognition. And I think the hope is that this could travel into the future. We've seen a bit of a reduction, I think, in our bizarre cultural adulation of the finance sector. And we've seen a bit of a rebalancing in our sense of who contributes real value to society. We've also seen, I think, increased recognition for the grassroots community level organizations that keep neighborhoods going, that keep families together, that keep young people feeling hope. And hopefully all of this could lead to improved pay, dignity and working conditions for key workers of all kinds in a way that ultimately young people will benefit from greatly. Fourthly, I think we've seen a massively strengthened ethic of care over the past year or so, a greater recognition that we are all fundamentally dependent on caring relationships. The pandemic has shown the immense capacity that exists in our societies to care for one another, to provide mutual support. There's a brilliant book called The Care Manifesto by a group called The Care Collective, and they set out clear ideas for how our society could be restructured radically around care. I think lockdown prompted a lot of people to slow down and reassess what really matters. Relationships, care, other people. I think it undermined the pressure to be acquisitive or competitive. Hopefully that could continue long into the future. Penultimately, I think inclusive education has gained much needed strength during the past year or so. Schools have provided incredible support for families and communities during the pandemic. And many were doing so long before the pandemic. Many schools which serve more disadvantaged communities have been providing a wide range of support for families for decades. Hopefully, I think the value of inclusive education and of schools providing wider forms of support for their local communities has been highlighted and will be strengthened. I would love to see British schools move more towards the Finnish model of EduCare, where education and welfare provision are much better integrated. We can make the most of the fact that schools are in a unique position as the only universal institution in society. There's no other institution other than school that we are all legally coerced to attend for many, many years. And so schools have real potential as hubs of provision, hubs of compassion, hubs of care for communities. And I think we've really seen that during the pandemic. Lastly, I think over the past few decades, there's been a rise in ecological realism. I think this is something that we've been aware of for a long time the need to care for our planet. But I think something about the pandemic seems to have brought home the extent of our planet's fragility. I think there's more realism now about the climate crisis and there's growing power behind ideas like a Green New Deal, especially among the young. So I do see ingredients for a much, much better society. And I think these ingredients have been nurtured during the past year. We could have a society which more equitably distributes life's, necess life's necessities and joys to young people of all backgrounds. That is possible 
But again, it's far from guaranteed, a bit like with my dystopia. I'm not exactly sure how we could best nurture all of these positive developments as individuals, as, as organizations. But I am quite sure that there's a brilliant generation of young people ready to strive for a better future. And maybe the best we can do is redouble our efforts to support them, to back them, to give them a platform, in some cases to move aside for them. I see a generation of young people who don't put up with prejudiced or discriminatory or exploitative crap. They're laser focused on systemic and structural injustices, and they're ready to address them and to build a better society. Generationally, our current crop of young people have been given an incredibly raw deal. So I think it's a matter of generational justice that we do all we can together with them to improve our societies. I have no idea what the future will hold in the next few decades after the pandemic. I have some ideas about some potential possibilities as I've shared, but it's not possible to predict exactly what's going to happen. I think the next few years will make a massive difference to the trajectory of our century though. I sincerely hope personally that the things that I consider to be green shoots will be strengthened and that some of those dystopian tendencies I mentioned can be weakened. Obviously, all of you will have very different ideas to me, I imagine, about what are the most important green shoots, what are the dystopian trends. I've presented a very personal perspective, my own personal individual reflections. I hope I haven't come across either too depressingly pessimistic or too hopelessly naive. And I hope I might have stimulated some reflections on the different possibilities that the future may hold for our young people. Thanks very much. Hi, Luke. Sorry, a bit of a delay with me coming back there. Thank you so much. That was um, really, really great. And I think really pulled in a lot of the themes, actually, that we've been talking about this week at, at Euromet. Um, I just wanted to pick up on, on um, a particular um, point around uh, kind of youth violence, really. I know you mentioned at the beginning that you've been, you were involved in the um, youth violence um, sort of inquiry and that kind of thing. Um, I mean, what what have you noticed in terms of trends in youth violence during the pandemic? And do you have any particular concerns about that sort of area? Because obviously today we've been talking a bit in the workshops about, about that. And, you know, I know you've done some work on the public health approach and that kind of thing. So I'm just really interested in your reflections on, on that as well, if that's okay. I, th I think again, I, I I didn't I didn't include it in my kind of reflections on on the immediate effects of the pandemic because I think it's incredibly complex and it, and it seems a bit kind of glib to say it varies. But but I think that that is um, what I've seen. I think some young people have been safer during the past kind of year or so because of the effects of the pandemic because of the way that they've kind of reintegrated with their family. Mm. In other cases, um, the opposite has happened and I think especially where the pandemic has contributed to family breakdown and to the breakdown of other kinds of supports mm. it left young people a lot more vulnerable to forms of exploitation or vulnerable to involvement in, in different kinds of um, harmful activity. Yeah absolutely we were hearing this morning about kind of online harms as well which is obviously you know there's been issues with that during the pandemic. Questions just come in here Luke um, asking how long do you think it will take for us to see signs of the direction our future will take and do you think older generations will in turn embrace what young people are fighting for? Um, I knew if I did a talk like this I'd get really, <laughs> I'd get really difficult questions. Um, so in, ter in terms of how long it will take I would have thought with it, within a couple of years of life seeming to return somewhat to normal, there will be a sense of the kind of historical forces and the tendencies that have been strengthened by the pandemic that, yeah. that will, will kind of grow in influence and grow in power in, in, in the future. In terms of whether older generations will embrace the ideas of, of, of the young, um, I, think we, I think we can be hopeful because I think things like ecological crisis um, and economic injustice are issues which which do affect everyone and people of all ages are increasingly aware of them. Mm. And I think the, the the fresh new ideas and the optimism of young people 
and the intellectual rigor and the political kind of um, strategy that young people are bringing um, is, is increasingly being recognized. I think there's, you know, th there's arguably been a kind of a dearth of new, new ideas of, of radical new possibilities for the future over the past few decades. I think young people are now bringing that. And so I think people are increasingly recognizing that. Brilliant, thank you. Um, just some comments coming through. Amazing talk. This has been brilliant keynote, Luke. Thank you so much. Um, so all very positive. And um, colleague here from Finland um, saying, I, th I think that in Finland, it's important that schools are equal. Of course, there are differences, but basically everyone should get the same quality of teaching. That resonates with what you were saying. Yeah, and, okay. I, and I think, and I think hopefully, I, I think there's just there's just necessities that every young person needs in their neighborhood in their community when they grow up and in some places you can have a brilliantly inclusive school which meets many of those needs uh. in, in other places it's more of a kind of local ecosystem of maybe sports clubs youth centers and schools kind of working in, in collaboration but but what is devastating and, and what is particularly concerning is where there are areas where there isn't much of an ecosystem of support for young people and there's a school which is cold and, and rigid and zero tolerance in its approach so that there isn't a kind of institutional warmth there isn't a kind of warm net of care around young people and yeah. i think certainly countries where there's greater equality and less competition between schools do a better job than we do when it comes uh -huh. to provi providing those kind of necessary cornerstones of well-being for all young people yeah no absolutely it's a great point okay um Final question at the moment, but just to encourage people, we've got sort of five minutes or so if we need it. So do put any, any more comments or questions. Um, so thanks, Luke. Really interesting and challenging to think through. Have you got any thoughts on ways to respond and support young people in their response around the recent race review? Again, quite a big question <laughs> for you, but I don't know if you've got any sort of thoughts about that. Um, I hesitate slightly. I mean, the, a, an obvious response is to say that I, it's not my voice isn't the kind of voice that should be the most Im, Im, important in, in this issue or, or necessarily listen to as much as the voices of those young people. So I think it goes back to the point about platforming the, the voices of young people, um, teaching them about evidence, teaching them about research, because obviously one of the biggest issues with the recent um, race review has been the shoddy nature of, of mm -hmm. the academic rigor there. And there's plenty of other resources um, which paint a, a, a much different, much better evidenced picture of what is going on in society when it comes to racial injustice. Mm -hmm. and I think those are resources that we should be talking to young people about, sharing with them, hearing and listening to their perspectives and views. Yeah, absolutely. Another question has come in just as you were speaking. Thank you for a thought provoking talk. In contrast with your dystopia, when you picture a better future, how do you reconcile the practical with the ideal? Do you have a guiding principle? <laughs> you are getting the tough questions today, Luke. I think people like have really warmed up over the last three days. And uh, I, like yeah. to say, I think it's my own fault. I was like a little <laughs> bit philosophical. So I've just been, I've been faced with even more philosophical things. Um, I think, I think, I think what I've noticed in this, this is going to sound a bit naff probably, but what I've noticed in the organizations that, that have most in, impressed me is that they they do they do contain contain the seed of a better society like they're, they're guided by a vision not just of we're this organization addressing this problem at this time for this reason in a kind of abstract way they're attentive to the particular context in which they work and how that community and our society could be better and they're working towards that as opposed to just dealing with kind of symptoms and and i think that there's there's a helpful contrast that's often used i think in, in the prison abolitionist community between reforms which are the pathway to a better future and reforms which are about just managing the present mm -hmm. and i think that's an important distinction to, to pay attention to kind of in politics in general what 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 changes are happening that are ultimately to put a stop to, to further progress and what changes are actually building blocks towards greater change. Yeah. And the distinction between the two isn't as simple as some are progressive, some are conservative. It's more to do with what what they're leading to in the future, if that makes yeah. sense. Sure, no, absolutely. Um, 
Another really interesting question that's just come in. Do we need macro changes at a structural and governmental level to ensure young people thrive for the future and we avoid your dystopia 2040? Or could grassroots movements and organizations lead the way? Or maybe it's a bit of both, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think, I think it has to be both. Mm. Like, I think um, we need warm, nurturing, supportive institutions as an urgent necessity for young people today. And we need grassroots organisations that are campaigning and, and fighting for a, a better future. But we do also need state level change. If, if, if you compare the well-being of young people in different countries, it correlates with countries in which state policies um, provide the necessities of, of well-being for young people. Um, so I think we need those grassroots organisations because if you just have state level change, that's a kind of a cold kind of re revolution. But you need massive redistribution of, of wealth and power ultimately to, to make those institutions anything more than just kind of sticking pl plaster. Sure. Yeah, no, absolutely. Great. Um, just before we end, uh, we've got a bit of a, a flippant point here. You mentioned you're an Arsenal fan, Luke. Yes. Does the fall of the Super League make you hopeful as an Arsenal fan? And again, this is a colleague from Finland. <laughs> ah, okay. Uh, I'm, pretty, I'm pretty pessimistic about Arsenal. My, my, I've, I've seen two eras of Arsenal in my lifetime. They were the glory years. And I'm now, I'm kind of settled into an almost contented depression when it comes to <laughs> Arsenal. They're, they're, firmly, they're firmly established as rubbish. I'm not going to build up my hopes in order to try to reduce suffering in the future. Brilliant. I'm going to bring it back just before we close. Um, a really good uh, comment in the chat, which everyone can can read, but basically saying that very similar scenarios have been painted um, here for Finland as what you predicted for England. And um, now a number of comments are coming in about which football teams people support. So I think we're going to do that. <laughs> 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 the audacity to put Manchester City, my goodness. Um, anyway, brilliant. Thank you so much, Luke. It's been very uh, thought provoking. I think an excellent keynote to kind of round up um, round up the conference because as i said you've covered many of the issues that we've talked about over the past uh, three days thank you to everyone who's taken part um, and asked questions and um, if you've got any other follow-up um, please do contact us um, here at catch 22 and we'll be in touch with, with luke about that and it's just left for me to say we've got 15 minutes before the next workshop starts so if you um, have a stretch of your legs and, and grab a cup of tea and then head back to the sessions uh, tab on the left hand side and you'll see all the options for the workshops this afternoon and after that we will see you back here on the main stage at 3 30 to wrap up the conference okay thank you luke thank you everyone see you soon thank you.